as threatened in my final lecture for this unit, we move back into the Protestant world. In 1648, the 80-year war between Catholic Spain and the rebellious Dutch Protestant provinces ended with the Treaty of Westphalia's recognition of an independent Dutch Republic. Germany remained a patchwork of more than 300 states. Sta Spain remained in control of Flanders, now Belgium, and southern Italy. The Netherlands emerged as a vital new political, economic, and cultural force. The Calvinist Protestants had no objection to lending money at interest, and Amsterdam replaced Florence as Europe's banking center. The Dutch East India Company dominated trade in the Indies and controlled much of the worldwide shipping that was bringing Europe new prosperity. Religious toleration attracted immigrants, including America's future pilgrims, and they further contributed to the Dutch wealth. At a time when most Europeans worked in agriculture, over half of the population of the Dutch Republic lived in towns of more than 30,000 people. This urban middle class had an insatiable appetite for paintings. Art historians estimate that between 5 and 10 million Dutch works of art were produced in the 17th century. So I'm turning again to Simon Schama and his Power of Art series, this one on Rembrandt, for an introduction to the culture of Amsterdam and to the work of perhaps the greatest portrait painter of all time, Rembrandt. So now we fast forward a decade and Rembrandt produced this masterpiece, one of the most famous paintings in art history. It is not on the list and I don't think any other single omission except maybe Picasso's Guernica has provoked more outrage from fellow art history teachers. Here's what I think. But if you would like to thwart the College Board's evil limitations on your education, the video up on Moodle analyzes it brilliantly. Here are the times we don't, alas, have time now. Well, with that out of my system, I'm going to succumb to the crushing might of the College Board and talk about their only required work by Rembrandt, which is an etching. But to be fair, why should I be fair? Rembrandt was also one of the great masters of etching in our history. To remind you, etchings are made by covering a plate of metal with wax, incising the drawing into wax, then pouring in acid that etches through the metal plate. Soft wax is easier to carve and it allows for more diversity of shading and depth, as you can see in this picture of Christ receiving the children. The deeper the etching, the darker the image. Chiaroscuro comes alive in prints, as by the way, it very much does in Rembrandt's paintings. This is the kind of religious art that pious Calvinists hung in their homes, though not in their churches, and Rembrandt made very serious money from this print. Our required Rembrandt etching dates from relatively early in his career, although this was also a time when Rembrandt was enjoying considerable commercial success. This marriage portrait marked the first time that Rembrandt has presented himself as an artist at work. He is highlighting his skill at drawing, a critical skill for a painter and for a creator of etchings. So this is a kind of ad for his art. I think it's quite intriguing that Rembrandt has etched himself so much more deeply. Saskia seems almost a pale shadow in comparison. And he's not looking at her, he's looking at us. On the other hand, she seems lost in her own thoughts as well. Is she validating his choice of profession by looking on? Is she wishing he'd get a real job? Rembrandt loved to draw and paint himself and his wife in different guises, complete with costumes. So here is Saski as a shepherdess in a pastoral scene. And here we see Rembrandt Saskia portrayed as a prostitute in a tavern, sitting on the lap of the prodigal son, which is another self-portrait of Rembrandt. You'll notice the resemblance to the etching, which was made a year earlier. But this Saskia is livelier and less detached, and Rembrandt looks as if he's had a few too many. The good times ended all too soon for the prodigal son and for Rembrandt. In fact, Rembrandt painted the end of this story just a couple of years before his own death. Some art historians consider this his greatest painting. Note that in his later paintings, Rembrandt's brushstrokes become even looser, almost impressionistic. Critics at the time thought he'd forgotten how to paint. I find his later paintings magnificent. Indeed, Rembrandt was both behind and ahead of his times. The next generation of Dutch patrons wanted more refined paintings. They were moving away from their Calvinist roots, and they wanted to be more like the French, the Italians, the stylish Baroque types. Rembrandt moved in the opposite directions. His paintings became rougher and darker. In many ways, he anticipated directions that art would take two centuries later. 
As the video mentioned, the rising Dutch middle class gobbled up portraits and one of its masters was Franz Hals. Okay, he didn't make the cut either, but I want you to see what is probably his most famous painting. Hals is especially admired for his ability to capture human expression and for his cheerful depictions of human nature. He also influenced another Dutch painter who, again, didn't make the college board cut, but I love her work and wanted you to see it see a little of it. The famous Dutch tolerance extended to women artists and Judith Leister had a successful career as a portraitist. Note the portrait that she depicts herself painting. In the portrait she depicts herself painting and painting skillfully. Remember Artemisia Gentileschi and stay tuned for Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun. This painting has shown up on past AP tests, so it just might be on your unit test as well, right? This is what is called a genre scene. Remember, a scene of ordinary life. And it has a typically Dutch moral bite. It seems very unlikely that the proposition that this well-dressed man is offering the more simply dressed young woman involved anything honorable. The subject matter, the moral undertone, the use of light, the interior scene all mark this work out as Dutch Baroque, and I could imagine you're being asked to identify it as such. You'll also see a resemblance to Vermeer, who's the painter of our next required work. In the past, the College Board has loved to use paintings by Vermeer for attribution essay questions. So I'd like to open our discussion with a clip from a video narrated by Meryl Streep, by the way, that shows a succession of famous Vermeer paintings. She closes with a question, what makes a Vermeer a Vermeer? When the clip is over, take a few minutes to come up with your own answer. Then we'll pick up the video again and hear one expert's answer as applied to our required work. So I know it's discombobulating to see several short clips from a video, but the video does a better job of describing Vermeer's use of perspective in this painting than I will, and you're hearing from real experts. The video mentions the conservation restoration of this painting. Here's a before and after picture. Something the video didn't mention, but the Khan Academy podcast did, is that her hand holding the balance is the exact center of the painting. The woman's hands, the jewelry, and the tabletop form the shape of a pyramid. This imaginary pyramid supports the woman's hand and encloses the balance. In other words, this seemingly simple painting was very carefully composed. One of the ways that Vermeer infuses his paintings with light is by using a technique that in the 19th century would be called pointillism, creating color combinations with tiny dots of paint. Here are details from a different painting. Post-impressionist painter Georges Seurat has dropped off the list, so I'm throwing him in here to illustrate pointillism. You probably don't have time, but if you do, Bugs Bunny has a great explanation of pointillism. In recent years, there's been a storm of controversy over how Vermeer created his paintings. It stems from speculation that he produced these exquisitely detailed paintings by cheating, kind of, and using a camera obscura or pinhole camera to copy his images. So here's a simple diagram of how a camera obscura works. And here's an illustration of how he might have used it to create perspective in one of his most famous paintings, the music room, music lesson. Pardon somebody else's French, I thought the illustration was clear enough. And here's the actual painting. Note, by the way, that Vermeer's paintings very often show a window that is emitting light, but we never see what's outside the window. Also notice, and this is true of the woman with the balance as well, that while the objects in the room cast shadows, the human figures do not, reinforcing the sense that they're absolutely caught and captured at a moment in time. So let me end with just a few more points about our required work, at least end the discussion of this work. Vermeer has made some interesting compositional choices. The bottom left of the painting in the background, for example, is higher than the bottom right to make room for the balance. And here's a comment from the National Gallery in Washington where this painting now lives. Quote, the interplay of verticals and horizontals of mass against void or emptiness and of light against dark creates a carefully balanced but never static composition. 
This subtly reinforces the theme of spiritual moderation. And that brings us to a final point, which I thought the Khan Academy brought out very well. What is this painting about? Art historians argue about that, but I find the interpretation I just read pretty plausible. Pearls are a traditional symbol of earthly vanity. Perhaps the woman is balancing vanity and modesty, her love of the world's wealth and her love of God. Likewise, a mirror can symbolize vanity, but it can also symbolize self-knowledge. Maybe here it represents both. The painting in the background of The Last Judgment certainly suggests that this woman should be focusing on her eternal soul. By the way, I find it interesting that Vermeer was a Catholic convert in the very Protestant Netherlands. He married a Catholic, and they actually named their first child Ignatius after the founder of the Jesuit order. Uh, this, oops, I went ahead. Uh, this isn't our required work, but it is an excellent example of another typically Dutch Baroque genre, still life paintings. These were also very popular with urban middle class customers, and they gave painters an opportunity to show off their ability to paint reflected light, transparent objects, and rich textiles. This painting also, of course, shows off the wealth and widespread trading connections of the urban merchant class. Even back then, Ming vases from China were pricey. This is the so-called vanitas still life that combines the customer's taste for luxury goods, the artist's mastery of realism, and a moral message. Notice there's a skull, a ticking timepiece, and an overturned glass, all sending the message that life is fleeting, fleeting, and you need to make the most of your time. Okay, finally, we come to our last required artist, although not yet her required work. Flower paintings were another very specific, very popular genre that showed off an artist's technical skill and fed the Dutch love for gardening. Notice that the brushwork here is tight and precise. It's really almost invisible in contrast to Rembrandt's broad, loose strokes and to Vermeer's dots of light. Note, too, the careful composition of this work with its strong diagonal. The painting may be still, but it's nevertheless dynamic. So I hope you watch the Khan Academy video because this work is not going to get enough time. This is another required work that we could have easily shifted to our next unit. Rachel Reich was the daughter of a noted biologist and naturalist, and this painting shows that she shared his interest in scientific observation, access to his impressive specimen collection, and probably an interest in the world revealed by the newly invented microscope. A Dutch invention. Do you recall the symbolic messages of this painting? The wheat and grapes may reflect the bread and wine of communion. And the color harmonies, we see lots of complementary reds and greens. So here's a close-up. Note a similarity to Vermeer. Both use points of light, to, points of paint to capture light. Now I'm going to close this podcast and this unit with just a few more paintings by this artist. So you're ready for an attribution question, right? 